Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you to McEwen for this uh, invitation to come and, and speak with you. And I'm going to be talking about what some might refer to as a disruptive technology, because what we've attempted to do is, uh, is make a change to uh, the mechanical aspects of froth flotation in a fairly dramatic way, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Woodgrove Technologies. We're based here in Toronto. Flotation has been the core to my career for 35 or 40 years now. Uh, I met Nate first at McGill. I ended up doing uh, about 11 years at that institution and came away with a few degrees, and I taught at U of T for a while. I was working for INCO for a while, and uh, then I was uh, one of the <clears throat> one of the lead staff at Minivex Technologies, and we sold Minivex in 2005. My business partner and I, Glenn Kozak, started Woodgrove in the fall of 2009. So what I'm going to talk to you today is where we stand with this technology. But most importantly, I want to talk on the theme that Nathan is interested in, and that's um, how to integrate technology, uh, how to bring technology that a smaller company has developed into the mining industry. And you, you mentioned uh, the article in the Globe and Mail this, uh, this weekend. Uh, well, this gentleman is the, is the CEO of Dundee Precious Metals, and that's his plant right there in Chalopesh. And Dundee is one of the companies that I'll be speaking about as, uh, as uh, a company that's helped us through their approach to integrate this technology. Um, so our objective has been to dramatically reduce both capital cost and operating cost of froth flotation circuits. And by dramatic, what we want to do, at least for the roughing aspect, we're interested and we think we can do and we believe we've proved it, uh, a 50% reduction in footprint and a 50% reduction in power consumption. Uh, so as you can imagine, the, the impact on capital costs and operating costs for, for big copper plants, for example, is, is pretty significant. Um, this is one of the, the, the devices I'm going to show you. This is uh, our, our flotation cell operating at Sasego in northern Brazil. I'll be talking about that in quite a bit more detail. And um, that cell, when the project was finished, was moved to Solobo, which is the sister plant, if you wish, of Sasego in the Carajás region. And uh, we've just finished supplying four new vessels for them. And that's a view of the froth treating rougher tailings. The tailings that were thrown away, this is, this is a unit producing froth off of that. So Nathan wanted to know a bit more about froth flotation, so we're going to have froth flotation 101. Froth flotation has actually been around, for, as Nathan said, more than 100 years, uh, but it's, it's incredibly complex. I think it's one of the most complex industrial processes that there are because it involves um, chemistry that's scary complex, hard to understand sometimes, um, various aspects of physics, and of course, a highly varying feedstock to the plant. So I want to give a quick review on flotation and use that to show where we felt there was an opportunity to improve. And I'll talk about the technology that we developed, and then most importantly, I'll talk about the approach to integrating this technology and uh, finally give a bit more about, uh, about who we are. So I'm going to keep this simple. Let's consider uh, an ore body that has three mineral species. So we're float trying to recover copper. So you've got copper sulfide minerals. Almost always you have pyrite getting in the way and then you have everything else. We'll call it rock, silicates, carbonates, oxides. So two broad aspects. There's the chemistry in flotation and you can think of the chemistry broken down into three primary categories surfactants to create a hydrophobic surface on the copper sulfides we refer to those as collectors it's not uncommon today to have two collectors in a flotation circuit it used to be we just had one but the chemical suppliers have been able to fine-tune that and we have surfactants to generate small gas bubbles and ensure that we get a proper stable froth with these bubbles that have collected the particles. These are frothers. And again, it's pretty common now to have two frothers uh, in, a, in a plant. Then we have various modifiers to control pH. So that's the chemistry aspect of the course. That's finished. We're going to move on to the 
physics of the course, and that's uh, what I'm going to focus on. The physics is pretty straightforward. Uh, number one, you want to create an opportunity for bubble particle contact. So these particles, some of them have been selectively made hydrophobic, and others are not. So now you need to bring them in contact with a gas bubble. Then you need to create an opportunity for froth collection in a relatively quiescent environment. We're going to be talking about this, create an opportunity for bubble particle contact. So how do we do that in industry? And there's a few different ways. The simplest one is column flotation. This is a photograph of uh, flotation columns at Cerro Verde in Peru, 5 meters in diameter, 14 meters tall. It's four of them for a final copper cleaning. Uh, generate gas bubbles at the bottom by sparging air. Bubbles rise up and contact the slurry that has the particle. So it's just called coursing bubble flotation. Um, another approach, very different, uh, is feed slurry gas contacting devices. There's various of these in the industry. Jameson pneumatic contact cells. And with these, you bring the slurry in contact with air uh, under pressure, so the slurry is pumped typically, and you have a very rapid process. So the resonance time in flotation columns is 30 minutes, sometimes much more. The resonance time in the contacting part of this device is less than a second. So two dramatically different ways of collecting gas bubbles. But these guys aren't the workhorse of the flotation industry. This is mechanical cells. This is a shot from the Laguna Seca concentrator at Escondida, BHP's operation. These are 150 cubic meter tank cells. Um, copper plants today are routinely putting 300 cubic meter tank cells in. And many projects are now looking at five and 600 cubic meter tank cells. They're just getting bigger and bigger. So, if you look at the schematic here inside the cell, there's an agitator, and we're obviously creating gas bubbles at the agitator. So we ask ourselves a question. Which mechanism of those two mechanisms that I described, coursing bubble or high shear, really dominates the mechanical cell in flotation? Our conclusion is the majority of particle collection occurs at the impeller, in the impeller zone at the birth of the bubble, if you wish. I like to call it the little bang theory instead of the other one. <laughs> uh, so what this tells us is that a lot of this area in the cells, not much is happening. There's some coursing bubble particle collection, but it's really inefficient. So where the particle collection is occurring is right there. So that has provided an opportunity, we believe, to achieve significant volume savings and significant power savings. So I'm going to talk now about how we did, took that information and proceeded with what we call our SFR technology. So that's the end of the flotation course. I'm an easy marker. Don't worry about the tough exams at the end. Froth flotation is pretty complex, but we've tried to break it down into this aspect of the mechanics that we think we can make a change on. There's the same schematic we just saw. So what we're saying is that's the zone of importance for particle collection and in a tank, in a cell like this, the slurry gets pumped around many times, 5, 10, 15 times, so particles come back. But the collection occurs really when they go through that impeller. So we've taken that zone and we've made a chamber. We call it the particle collection unit. It's the first, it's the first unit of three stages that we have in our device. So the mechanism is quite similar, except instead of when it pumps around, instead of the slurry flying out into the cell, it hits the wall and comes back in. Okay, we inject air in the bottom of that. So <clears throat> this is the unit that we eventually built in Brazil. It runs at 930 tons per hour, which was 50% of the flow at Sasego. Um, feed slurry coming in. And this is that little schematic I just showed you, the uh, particle collection unit. This, this is a pretty big one, obviously. Uh, drive at the top, the agitator inside. And then what happens, we now have particles attached to gas bubbles. So now we want to recover those from the slurry. So there's a transfer pipe 
that carries the slurry and the gas bubbles across into the next units. We've got a bubble disengagement unit to allow slurry to come out and exit a tailings valve that you can't see it's on the back side. And at the top, a froth recovery unit. So each of these three stages can be individually designed for optimizing that process. For example, the froth recovery unit, we will often constrain it to very, very small surface areas. So hence, it's a uh, staged, there's three stages, it's flotation, and we needed a noun, reactor sounded better than thing, so there we are, where it's our staged flotation reactor, the SFR, and we developed, the first one you'll see in a few minutes was, was run in Newfoundland. The top of the unit is much smaller surface area than mechanical cells. Um, so we have very high solids flux off the top, and we have an extremely low gas rate, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the gas rate that would be used in a mechanical cell. So, it's really, so we end up with higher selectivity and obviously lower costs for gas. And again, here's the top of the unit at um, Solobo. Just a few more photographs, and I'm going to come back to this. This is at Chalopesh, Dundee's operation. The very first one we, we installed was at the uh, Pine Cove concentrator of Anaconda Mining. Uh, it's in um, uh, northwestern Newfoundland. Uh, this operation has been in, in operation continuously 24-7 now since July of 2010. Um, it only runs about 45 tons an hour, and one of our objectives was to take that and go to the industry, and the industry was saying, well, we need it at 1,000 tons per hour. So the issue of scaling up is where we got uh, the assistance from industry that you will see became so critical to allowing us to do this rapidly. So the advantage of this project for my business partner, Glenn Kozak, and I was that we had an opportunity to work with some fabulous people in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, the guys there were tremendous people to work with and they're still running this, this little operation, Anaconda Mining. So a summary of our <coughs> technology, the mechanical shear for bubble particle contact. It's not coursing bubble and it's not pumping, so we don't need to pump into each one. The froth area is compressed. We can use uh, froth water washing and we have no pumping between stages. So you can see you go down like mechanical cells will. The net effect is a significantly lower footprint and a significantly lower power consumption. So I'd like to talk now about two approaches we had to integrating this technology. Um, first one uh, was the, what I would like to call the early adopter, and that's um, Dundee Precious Metals. Uh, Nate referred to Rick Howes, who's the CEO of, uh, of Dundee. Rick and the other fellows there, Simon Meek, uh, were really critical in, in allowing us essentially to help develop their te the technology at their concentrator. They believed in what we're doing and they were prepared to share the risk with us and that was absolutely critical. So we started this at the Celopesh operation in Bulgaria, copper gold operation. Um, we started with four SFRs for copper cleaning. We had one and then we installed three more. That replaced 26 older and smaller mechanical cells. Um, installation occurring of the SFRs. You can see the agitator here. So that's a small tank separate from the vessel that the froth is removed on. And a view of the froth at the top. We then went on and had the opportunity to install eight SFRs for a new pyrite gold circuit uh, that Dundee installed. Uh, that's now been running for two years, and that is this circuit here. Uh, this is an existing building they had. You can see it's long and narrow. There wasn't enough room for mechanical cells. The SFRs fit into this building. So we have eight units producing a, a, a pyrite gold concentrate that they sell for the sulfur value and for the gold value. Uh, another early adopter was um, New Gold's operation at New Afton in British Columbia, in Kamloops. We did a lot of pilot plant testing on site with, Cam at, with uh, New Afton. 
And subsequent to that, we ended up installing three units. A paper was presented on it at the CMP in January past. And these guys here, now the three of them are producing 60% recovery off of the regrind cyclone overflow. That's 8% copper, and these take it up to 30% copper. Uh, each of these pipes here are carrying under froth water to allow for a increased concentrate grade. Installation occurring, and you can see here the froth zone has been necked down a lot, so I referred to that earlier, that we can manipulate the size of each of these three stages independently, so that that is, ma is optimized for the amount of solids that want to come off, and there's a top view of it. So the second approach we had was uh, the consortium. Uh, this consortium we put together, the objective was to is demonstrate that we could scale up from 40 tons an hour to 900 or 1,000 tons per hour. Um, these are the companies that participated in it, all of them financially, but especially Valet. Valet put up their hand and said they wanted to be the host company for the site. And that worked out exceptionally well for us. It uh, was a long project. The project uh, uh, spent between six and seven million dollars. Uh, it took about three years to complete. And we issued the final report on it just about eight months ago. Objective was to demonstrate scale up to approximately 930 tons per hour. And we had the opportunity at this plant to treat both rougher feed and rougher tailings. It's an outdoor plant, and uh, the rougher feed and the rougher tailings of 50% of the plant was piped into this unit so that we could run head to head against the existing equipment. So Sago Mine is in the Carajás region of Brazil. It's been in operation now for 11 years. You can see the flotation circuit here. There's two lines of rougher cells, seven. Uh, cells each 160 cubic meter tank cells and we took the feed of one of those rows and diverted it. The SFR was sitting in this region down there. And again that's the unit. The project included getting this built. We looked after the construction of it in Belo Horizonte and then there was supply of all this equipment. An awful lot of piping, a lot of engineering for this project. And here's a view of the system in operation uh, on rougher feed and this one is on rougher tailings where we narrow the opening down to get a very high solids flux at the end of the circuit. So as we progress down a, a bank where we have lower and lower solids coming off then we can s uh, make the diameter at the top smaller as well and we simulated that with this unit by being able to put inserts at the two sides here. Another view of the unit operating. Uh, the conclusion of the project uh, immediately after Valet purchased the unit and moved it to their sister plant, Solobo. Uh, Solobo started up, it's a copper gold operation, started up about four years ago. That was Solobo 1, Solobo 2 started up uh, about a year and a half ago. And they moved, and it's only about 150 kilometers apart, these two, these two concentrators. So this is the same particle collection unit as you saw. We built a new unit here. The previous one was five meters in diameter. We found out that we didn't need it that big. This one's 2.9 meters diameter, and it goes up to the froth there. Um, that, was, that started operation in August of this past year, and within a month, it was working to the point that they ordered three more of them. There's four rougher rows, and this has been installed as the last stage of roughing. In other words, collecting copper and gold that was going out to tailings. So we're currently commissioning the next three units right now. That's the top view of that unit. Some other current projects that we have going, uh, Krumovgrad, Dundee will eventually put a plant in Bulgaria, the Krumovgrad operation. 
uh, gold operation, and we've completed the engineering um, on that with 19 SFRs for roughing and cleaning. Uh, BHP, we've been very active with BHP on their, their Spence project, which will be copper flotation circuit in northern Chile. And we are, we've done about 300 pilot plant runs in Santiago, Chile, and we're doing more today as we speak variability. And the engineering is underway right now for SFRs and copper roughing, copper cleaning, and for the Molly circuit. We have many pilot plant and design projects underway. Uh, this is the pilot plant. It runs, we can typically run with about 25 or 30 kilograms of drill core uh, ground to do a test where we can then simulate multiple stages, as many stages as we want, 10 or 12 stages in a row. Um, take a batch of feed and run it through. So it's a pretty simple uh, unit and we can take it into plant sites as well. We can put several of them together in series if we need to. This is in Santiago. Generally, we work with one. And we presently have uh, six of these pilot plant units scattered around the place. So who are we? Well, we're called Woodgrove Technologies. We now have about 40 staff, mostly engineers. The engineers are mostly process engineers, but also electrical and mechanical engineers. Our, our head office is here in Toronto. We have satellite offices in Vancouver, Santiago, Belo Horizonte, and Johannesburg. And each one of these satellite offices with really well-qualified engineers running those offices. So people who know us would say, I didn't realize you were that big. Well, we weren't that big until about three weeks ago when we merged with Portage Technologies. So this Michael Schaffer from Portage gave you guys a presentation November past, I think it was. On, on his technology, and we have brought these two companies together, friendly merger. Portage has froth characterization systems, amongst other aspects that you saw, um, and it has cyclone detection systems. Both of these will enhance our offering to industry as we bring rougher applications of SFRs to the industry. So it's a, it's a, um, I think it's a really compatible group between the two technology, the two companies. Finally, I'd like to thank Simon Meek in particular, Konstantin Petkoff, Costa Petkoff, from Dundee, of course the whole Dundee organization for the opportunity to go into Chalopesh and for them to have the blind faith essentially in us to be able to go out and do the work. Um, and our thanks to Valet and the many corporate partners in the Sasego SFR program. Um, it was challenging, really, really challenging project. Of course, doing anything in the Amazon um, makes it more difficult. But the the engineers uh, at Valet were fantastic to work with. This is the Sasego SFR team, and uh, those guys uh, helped get us through all of this. So, in closing, I just like to say that. This, I think, is a pretty good example of how smaller service technology company that Canada has hundreds or thousands of in everything from geology to mining to processing to material science. I think this is a couple of good examples on how we can, we being the smaller companies, can integrate with the mining companies. Um, and we obviously cannot do it without projects like this. We want to deliver things the mining companies want, otherwise why do it? And by having projects like this where we can have the collaboration, both sides are prepared to take the risk, then I think there's a lot to be gained. Helps us make some of these paradigm shifts that our industry needs and our society wants us to do. So, thanks very much for your attention and uh, open to any questions you have. <laughs>